The 2024 NBA playoffs are right around the corner, and I like to pick a team every year in that upcoming playoffs who I think has a chance to make some noise when there really aren't super high expectations for them. However, the NBA has been so ridiculous this year, particularly the NBA's Western Conference, where I'm actually not too sure what my pick is, and I am kind of torn. Hello everybody, welcome to Oscar Rusty Butkus. Subscribe to the channel if you have not already, and drop a like on this video. It only takes one second, and it makes a massive difference in how the video performs in the YouTube algorithm. Also, if you've not checked out my main channel recently, if you haven't seen it already, be, be sure to go do that. It's going to be linked in the description. It is about the MVP, the history of the race, and how it's changed recently, and I make my prediction for MVP at the end of it. And actually, by the time this this is coming out you have probably seen the chapter 4 clip on this channel so yeah go check that shit out if you haven't already but with that said we are going to be talking about the playoff dark horses and i'm going to go over a couple of different teams that i think it could be but i'll lead towards the end that i do have two teams that i really feel pretty strongly about and i just it's like asking me to pick a favorite child, I guess. First of all, we're just going to look in the Eastern Conference because the West is obviously the much more stacked conference. Might make a video about this up at some point, but I think there's a discussion to be had about this potentially being the strongest conference in NBA history, the, the West this year. I know there's like the that 2000s that year in the 2000s i think it was like 2007 where the denver nuggets won 50 games and they were the eighth seed right now the houston rockets are at 500 and they're not even in the play-in tournament currently yeah the west is wild and there's a lot of good teams i think literally every team that will be in the west will be a good ass team in the east not so much there's some potential for some pretty stinky teams to relative to the rest of the league to actually make a spot. And among just the teams in the Eastern Conference, there is of course the Miami Heat. It really depends on your definition of a dark horse for the Cavaliers, the Magic, and the Knicks. Those are all teams that I think could be perceived that way because while some people have, ma have made claims of the Knicks or the Cavaliers and maybe even a few out there people saying this about the Magic, that they are contenders, they're, they're sure as hell not the top of the line contenders. They're not the guys that everyone actually thinks is going to be making the finals as for orlando the fact that this is their first time making the playoffs together they're having so much of their offense dictated by second and i think is franz a fourth or third years play year player i think he's a three third year player that's not ideal not saying anything about what their future looks like because they do have a bright future but in terms of just tangibly how good they'll be in the playoffs this year, I'm not really expecting it to be that great. As of right now, their matchup in round one looks like it's going to be the Knicks. Uh, and man, I, I kind of love that matchup. If you're a fan of 90s basketball, watch Knicks versus Orlando because that's some 90s ass basketball right there. At least as close as you're going to get to it in the modern NBA. I feel sorry for the rim in that series. As for the Knicks, I think the Knicks have a decent shot. The problem is they're entering the playoffs on their back foot because they've dealt with so many injuries, both to Julius Randle and uh, Jalen Brunson. But ever since, once they made that OG and Anobi trade, they looked very, 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 very good <laughs> out of the gate before those injuries plagued them and ultimately knocked them back. Also, right before those injuries happened, they made a trade for uh, Boyan Bogdanovich as well as Alec Burks. Alec Burks kind of sucked for the Pistons this year, but he's had a good good-ish history with the Knicks and I don't know how he's played since being there but he could theoretically be an option but Bogdanovich is a 20-point score off the bench ain't nothing to complain about so I do think that they could look very good theoretically in the postseason but I definitely do feel that they just will not be able to compete with the Celtics and ultimately that's the that's the metric you know and that's how it works for the Western Conference as well it's like can you beat the Nuggets can you beat the Celtics if I'm saying no, you're probably not winning because I really don't think fucking anybody else can unless you just get lucky and they knock them off. The Miami Heat, obviously, they love to play this game where they aren't that good in the regular season. They're currently the seventh seed right now with only seven games above 500, which is good, but not outstanding by any means. But then they come into the playoffs and they absolutely kick ass. I'm not going to bet against the Miami Heat being a pretty major factor in the Eastern Conference playoffs until I see it not happen. They have gone to the conference finals three out of the last four years, so I'm just not going to, I'm not going to count them out. I refuse to do it until it's proven otherwise that the black magic of the Miami Heat 
is no longer effective. As of right now, I think they can be very good for sure. Don't think they can beat the Celtics, but they did beat the Celtics last time. But this Celtics team is fairly different by quite a substantial margin. Two different starters got rid of some of the more inconsistent players on this team when inconsistency was a huge issue for Boston. That's why they started off the series going down 3-0 in the first place and then looked way better than Miami for the next four games. Not the last one, unfortunately for them. All of these teams in the East, I didn't even talk about the Cavaliers. The Cavaliers, given how they got bitch smacked by the Knicks last year, who were not even good like that good by comparison to what I think the Knicks are now. I think the Knicks are a much improved team from last year when healthy, of course. The Cavs, they got better this year. I think that even though Darius Garland has started to slip, then again, this last couple of this last stretch of games, he's been a lot better and he's looking more like himself as the days go on. So I'm I'm confident he'll be fine, but he definitely had a weird year and a bad year for a large majority of it. Part of that was dealing with lingering injuries, to be fair. Jared Allen, great this year. Evan Mobley started shooting threes. You know, that's something. I don't know how much that's going to actually tangibly matter. I don't know how much Evan Mobley will truly work because I always worry about that double bigs thing. It's kind of like a double-edged sword thing where you get that amazing defense from having Mobley and Allen on the floor together, but you also have the spacing issues and that's consistently something they run into. And the Cavaliers are kind of split into two teams where it's the big man and the small guards and the small guards carry the offense and shoot all the threes and the big men carry the defense because they don't play any fucking perimeter defense. And it just ends up being like not a well-balanced enough team on either end of the floor. So I do have those concerns for them. Isaac Okoro being great this year is a big plus. They didn't really have a great third, the, the, the three man, you know, also Karis LeVert's been better and more consistent this year than he was last year. I do think that the Cavaliers can make like a second round, but I, I don't think I'm quite seeing contender here. Another factor is that Donovan Mitchell and how he performs in the playoffs. He's been great this year. This has been a better year for him than last year as well. The last couple of playoffs, he hasn't quite lived up to to the playoff elevation reputation that he had. He definitely did not in the Knicks series last year. So some of that depends on him because the Cavaliers, like whether or not Donovan Mitchell truly has playoff superstar production is kind of inconsistent. But when he does, it really feels like he can take his team a lot further than you would otherwise expect. Sure, it's possible. But moving on to the Western Conference, there's three teams that you can really perceive as dark horses. I mean, I guess that's not true. I guess you could believe the Lakers or the Warriors have some juice in them to actually do something. I don't. At this point, the Phoenix Suns are the eighth seed and they have a negative 14 average in the fourth quarter, which is fucking shit. It'd also be weird to call them a dark horse because so many people were calling them contenders going into the year, but at the same time, they are lower seeded than the teams that I'm going to call dark horses. So now I guess, are we? have people officially eliminated the Phoenix Suns from the contender category or do people still believe that I honestly haven't gauged that in quite a while. All I want to say is, look at me, I was right, okay? Nick always says on his podcast, this is not a victory lap podcast. This is a victory lap YouTube channel, okay? I was right about the Phoenix Suns. I called it out immediately that this was not a legitimate contender. Here they are, the eighth seed. The fact that they're going to be in the play-in more likely than not. All I'm saying, injuries were a factor. I know injuries were a factor, but even when the team's fully healthy, it's still not, still not enough. Anyways, I'll take my hater hat off. The three teams in the Western Conference that I think could make some noise are the Sacramento Kings, the New Orleans Pelicans, and the Dallas Mavericks. The Sacramento Kings, uh, I don't feel as strongly about them. A spoiler alert, the two teams that I'm hung up on is the Mavericks and the Pelicans, but the Kings no doubt have a lot of talent. The Sabonis Fox duo is one of the best duos in the entire league. I love the synergy that they have. Malik Monk is probably going to win six man of the year. They have a lot of solid depth. You know, they're not the deepest team in the world, but they're definitely not a not deep team either. Defense is always the thing with them. They're not a spectacular defense by any means. They're a pretty spectacular offense though. Interestingly enough right now, if the playoffs were to start today, they would match up with the Minnesota Timberwolves, which is very interesting because that is completely an offense versus defense series because the Timberwolves are heavily skewed towards the defensive side of the ball and the Kings are heavily skewed to the offensive side of the ball. Either way, Sacramento, I like them, but I don't feel as highly about them as I do New Orleans and Dallas. And as for my pick for who's the dark horse, it really is so strongly torn between these two teams because they have two 
pretty dramatically different approaches to how they do things, but both of them are ones that I think can be effective in a playoff setting. So the New Orleans Pelicans this year, they've looked more like the Pelicans that I thought they've had the potential to be for a very long time and just haven't really gotten to it because Zion has consistently been hurt. But this year, he's managed to be relatively healthy. I think he's missed some time, but nothing significant, especially by comparison to what he has at other stages of his career. The Pelicans are super deep. The more you look at it, they might be the deepest team in the entire NBA. I mean, they have such good wings. They have a good backup point guard. Trey Murphy, Herb Jones is shooting 45% from three. Trey Murphy is one of the best shooters in the entire NBA, and he's also really athletic and a solid defensive player. Zion is Zion. Brandon Ingram is Brandon Ingram. CJ McCollum is shooting 42% from three on nine attempts per game, which is just elite, elite spacing. This team's fucking good, and they have been kind of rolling lately and looking more and more like a legitimate threat. They started the year off kind of disappointing, but as the point Zion thing kind of came to be, they really started to hit their stride. It's interesting for Zion, and this is something that I'll elaborate further on in a video at some point, but Zion has kind of taken a step back in terms of scoring the ball versus what he was doing just even in his second year. But he seems to be a more effective player this way, where it's not so much forcing the ball into the paint, even though he's so good at doing it, he's still going to score so often when he's doing that. But he's taking his opportunities a little bit more liberally and then just passing the ball when he doesn't have those opportunities and he's a really talented playmaker as soon as he came into the nba i was like dude you need to get this guy in more playmaking opportunities i didn't think they'd ever reach the point where they're doing this and they did it pretty fast so glad to see they did that the concern that you might have for the pelicans is their playmaking is more by committee between zion ingram and cj they're really the assist men on the team i'm sure jose alvarado does a little bit as well but you know those are the guys who are dictating the offense 90 percent of the time and none of them are elite playmakers they're all pretty good and that's nice but the importance of elite playmaking i think is becoming more and more prevalent in the modern nba uh specifically because the with spacing and defensive scheme being the way that they are these days there is almost always going to be an open opportunity somewhere after you've broken down the defense the better you are at making the read to getting the ball to that open guy the more likely you are to dominate and the fact that that opportunity is always there if you have elite playmaking you can like get a great shot all the time especially if that player is also an absurdly talented scorer who can score 36 points per game like Luka Doncic can and that's where the Dallas Mavericks come in as a definitely not as good team, but one that has a superstar factor to it. Zion not really playing at a superstar level right now. I think he can still get there, especially if he can get a couple of more healthy seasons under his belt. I actually feel really good about the Pelicans going into next year. Again, if health permits them, I think they can start the year up hot and stay there rather than times in the past where they were really good and then really bad, or this year where they were pretty bad and then really good. Really good for a full year would be ideal. But the Luka factor plays so hard into this. The Kyrie factor plays pretty hard into this. You know, if, whether or not Kyrie is better than Zion or Brandon Ingram, you know, regardless of how you feel about that, at the very least, I think we'd agree he's in a similar ballpark to them enough so that like they might have the third best player or the second best player, depending on who you ask in the series, on top of having the best player. And I think having competent enough role players. After the traded line, I think the Mavericks got to the point where their role players are pretty solid. Don't get me wrong, things can be better. I think Tim Hardaway Jr.'s defense is something that routinely bites them in the ass, uh, and it sometimes makes it seem like his offense isn't worth it. Josh Green, not as good as I thought he could be at this point. Still good, still good. Jaden Hardy probably just doesn't really get as much opportunity because of Kyrie and Luka. But anyways, I think they've got enough to be a solid defense and then a spectacular offense led by Luka Doncic. And Luka Doncic is one of those guys. One of those guys where if you've got him, there is a fucking chance that you can win any series against any team. I would say it's akin to, not directly, because he's not quite as good, but when LeBron was on the Cleveland Cavaliers and the big three Boston Celtics were a thing, and we were like, Maybe LeBron can beat the big three Celtics single-handedly. Maybe he can do that. It's fully plausible. 
and he got close to doing it a couple of times. Luca's like that. Luca can win a series. He has no business winning. I think that Phoenix Sun series in 2021 was a series they had no business losing or no business winning but Luka Doncic luka all over the Suns and won. That factor, it's like, do I choose the deeper, more well-rounded team, or do I choose the less deep, but more top-heavy, superstar-driven team? Now, historically speaking, you go with the superstar, but I also feel like as the last couple of years have gone, the importance of that superstar factor is not as high, not that, you know, teams are winning without superstars. So that is still ultimately a huge hindrance to the Pelicans, but just that depth and a well-rounded system, having a lot of wings like the Pelicans do, things like that definitely really help you win. And you can potentially win a series where you're outclassed at the top because you have a lot more at the bottom. And I think the Pelicans could be that. There is one more problem with the Pelicans, which is Jonas Valanciunas. Jonas Valanciunas is a competent center and i think that's the problem i think he's just fine and he's not a good defensive player really not in a playoff setting anyways he's really got lead feet and it's not like he has those lead feet and in, in exchange he's some spectacular rim protector because he's not there's really no positive trade-offs he's just a slow guy who's kind of big and sometimes being big makes him all right but that's about as good as it's going to get and then offensively speaking he doesn't really have skills that are super complementary to everybody else he's a strong finisher he's a decent post scorer he has he shoots threes and they go in at a high percentage however he shoots like one maybe two a game so it's not really a huge factor and believe me in the playoffs teams are going to leave Valanchunas wide open I don't care if he's hitting him okay they're gonna keep leaving him open because if you lose to Jonas Valanchunas threes then I guess you lose to Jonas Valanchunas threes you accept that result so honestly I think he might not get played all that much in a postseason setting and I'm not sure how well the Pelicans can go small Zion at center is something they've experimented with I'm not sure how much they've actually used it this year but I, I just don't know that it would win in a playoff setting against a truly good team, especially if they have really good big man play. The Mavericks, on the other hand, you know, Derek Lively and Daniel Gafford, they're not super offensively talented guys. They can't score the way that Valanchunas can, but they are a lob target, which gives you the vertical spacing factor. They're good screeners, not that Valanchunas isn't. They are really solid to good defensive players, depending on the night, good rim protection, good rebounding solid size so they're better defensive players and offensively their role is more limited which i think is for the better because honestly why the fuck am i calling a valanchunas post up if i have brandon ingram zion and cj mccollum you know maybe in the regular season when he's playing big minutes without those guys but in the playoffs when one of those guys is always going to be on the floor i would rather them be doing something on offense creating in some way rather than a post up for valanchunas Unless there's a mismatch, it's just kind of a waste. I think for that reason and for the superstar factor, while I don't think the superstar factor is as significant as it used to be, it is still significant. So I'm gonna go with the Dallas Mavericks as my dark horse. That said, I think the Mavericks and the Pelicans could make some noise and surprise some people. And I think in general, in the Western Conference, there is a lot of upset potential. There are a lot of teams that we have billed as the top dogs that I think are not that much better than the teams below them. I mean, you look right now, the eighth seed, the Phoenix Suns, they only have eight less wins than the OKC Thunder who have the most wins in the conference. It's not a big gap in terms of how much these teams are actually capable of winning. And that definitely means that we can see some upsets. This West is crazy. I think right now, just looking at what the bracket says it would be right now, like I think the Mavericks or Suns could beat, actually, I don't really think the Mavericks or Suns could beat the Nuggets. That is the 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 thing <laughs> that's just the first one i looked at but i think the kings could beat the wolves i think the pelicans could beat the clippers i think the mavericks suns lakers or warriors could theoretically beat the thunder i definitely especially think the mavericks could that's just the way the seating could go right now obviously there's going to be some mixing and matching from here for the last couple of games of the season the dallas mavericks i think they're going to be my pick they 
have the superstar factor. They have a great second option. They have some pretty solid role players. Luka is such a good offensive generator that there's almost always going to be a good shot. I also think because Kyrie's there, the factor of like Luka having to carry too much could hopefully be dialed back. He's obviously still producing at the same level, actually more than he ever has before. But I think in a postseason setting, he can at least not be like shooting the ball literally every fucking possession, which happens <laughs> for them. Uh, games where he shoots like 30 shots because who the hell else is going to? I'm going with the Mavericks. Jason Kidd is the big factor there because I think he's one of the worst coaches in the league. But I think the Mavericks could win a series against anybody because of Luka Doncic. If you want to hear more thoughts about this, especially from some other people, because you're probably sick of listening to me talk at this point, our podcast, we recently went over if the playoffs ended today, we discussed what those matchups would look like. So go check that out if you have not already. Uh, but that's it. Shout out to Nick for editing this video and goodbye.